what is the Eucharist? The word Eucharist, uh, of course, uh, means um, in Greek, to give thanks. The Mass is a prayer of thanksgiving. So throughout uh, the Eucharistic celebrations, this motive of thanksgiving will surface every now and then. You will hear that expression, so let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And the congregation will reply, it is right and just. That is uh, at the preface. And then you will continue. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Father, Holy. That preface will be uh, concluded with the holy, holy, holy. It simply uh, brings up these characteristics of the Eucharist as thanksgiving. And then you see uh, like the doxology, which is the part um, uh, when the priests uh, elevate the sacred host and the consecrated wine. When it is possible, it is uh, sunk uh, to him and with him and in him. Uh, so that whole doxology to the Holy Trinity uh, is meant to be a song of praise and thanksgiving also. Then we receive Holy Communion and we realize that uh, Christ is present to us in a very special manner. And that would be a perfect time uh, for us to have a chat with the Lord. And during that moment, the most appropriate prayer would be thanksgiving. Uh, thanking the Lord for the blessings that we receive uh, over the past week. Uh, that is if you attend, uh, participate in the Mass once a week. But of course, if you go for daily Mass, and then and that Thanksgiving is uh, given uh, in the daily basis. This Thanksgiving that occurred uh, in the Eucharistic celebration, of course, uh, is intimately linked to our daily life. Uh, our day-to-day -day living is meant to, to be an expression of our gratitude to God. And we are very conscious that all that we have, our health, our food, our clothes, our home, our friends, and various uh, experiences, both the joyful as well as uh, painful experiences, these are all occasions by which the Lord shower His blessings upon us so for the person of faith, uh, we want to acknowledge God for who He is and what He has done for us. In the Eucharist, we express it in that collective, communal, as well as personal prayer. And in our day-to-day -day living, we express it by the way uh, we live out our faith. And then there are three questions uh, which is linked to this uh, heading, the importance uh, of the Eucharist. Why is the Eucharist so important? Why is it the cornerstone or the big rock of the church? Uh, can the church exist uh, without the Eucharist? The Catechism of the Catholic Church explains that the Eucharist is the source and submit of the Christian life. And the other sacraments, indeed all the other ecclesiastical ministries and works of apostolic are bound up with the Eucharist and are oriented towards it. Well, in the Eucharist is contained the whole spiritual good of the church, which is Christ himself, our past. So if we are close to the Lord, one very important and efficacious way by which we can be intimately in touch with him, then is through uh, the participation of the Eucharist. The way we express our faith are three-dimensional. We have our hate, intellectual, assent, our belief. We have the liturgical celebrations and we have our moral life, the way we live our life. So it involves how we think, how we celebrate, and how we act. And these are 
interconnected. So the way we celebrate the Mass then is also an expression of what we believe, our relationship with God, our relationship with the world, with other people, and our personal integrity and how we should live our lives. Our spirituality has the Eucharist as its source. The way light streams forth from the sun. Also, this spirituality has the Eucharist as the highest point to which all our actions should ultimately be directed. Now, we believe in the real presence of Jesus. So, from him, we obtain all the necessary graces and our whole life is oriented towards him. The Eucharist is the starting point of showing who Christ is with us when we live our daily life in the world. And then it takes us back home to the Eucharist as the supreme expressions of how our lives are being lived. Later on, uh, I will explain to you uh, the term that we use, another word that we use to express the Eucharist, the Mass. And this word, the Mass, precisely express this interconnectedness between the Eucharistic celebrations and our life, expressing the presence of Christ in the Eucharist and moving up to the world, to our daily life, and bringing all our experiences in our life back to the Eucharist, offer them to the Lord, surrender them to the Lord, giving thanks to God and uh, imploring His uh, continuous blessings and guidance. The Eucharist is the continuous and renewed experience of the unconditional love of Christ for human beings. In it, we experience God becoming man, living, acting, communicating, dying, and rising for us. We use the word Paschal mystery to sum up this whole experience of Christ, his life, from his incarnation, his birth, to his public ministry, and heightened in the experience of his death and resurrection. That whole experience of the Paschal mystery is what we have uh, in the Eucharist. During the Eucharist, there are two essential liturgical parts, the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. They are designed in such a way for us to have that Paschal experience mentioned earlier. What is the difference between the Eucharist and the Mass? Must there be the Eucharist in every Mass? How is the Eucharist different from the Jewish Passover meal, even though the sacrament was instituted during the celebration of Jewish Passover? Now, this question five and six is interesting. Uh, uh, the questioner put the question in that manner, uh, in a way, betraying his or her lack of understanding that the Eucharist is the Mass. The Mass is the Eucharist. Uh, uh, it is one and the same thing, just two different expressions. Uh, so to ask the question, uh, must there be Eucharist in every Mass? Is a, a very strange, <laughs> because Eucharist is the Mass, then of course the Eucharist occurred in the Mass. The person who asks these questions uh, probably uh, have in mind the Eucharist as, as only the receiving communion, uh, but do not understand the word Eucharist as the expressions of the entire liturgical celebrations. Anyway, there are many expressions, many terms that we use to express the Eucharist. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the first meaning, the literal meaning of the word Eucharistia in Greek, which means Thanksgiving, we mentioned that. But then there are other names used to describe it because the Eucharist is so rich in content that uh, it is just difficult to exhaust its uh, 
explanations uh, by the use of one single word. In the early church, um, the term used for the Eucharist is actually the breaking of bread. And of course, uh, this breaking of bread uh, is most expressed during the, the Mass. Um, in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, we have the mentioning that they remain faithful to the teaching of the apostles, to the brotherhood, community life, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So here the expression, the breaking of bread, means the Eucharist. That means in early church, very from the very beginning, uh, after the ascension of Christ, Christians gathered together for the Eucharist. This breaking of bread, uh, of course, in the letter of St. Paul and also in the institution narratives in the synoptic gospels, you have the expressions, Jesus took the bread, said the blessings, broke it and gave it to the disciples. So the breaking of bread, which is a referring also to Christ breaking of himself, sacrificing himself for us and dying for us on the cross. And in that dying and rising of Christ, sharing eternal life with us. During the Eucharist, uh, the explicit sign of the breaking occurred when we pray, Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. It is at that moment that you can see, if you pay attention, that the priest break the bread and this Christ present who has sacrificed himself, he will be our bread of life. That expression, uh, the bread of life, is found in John chapter 6. In the Gospel of John, uh, he omitted the institutive institution narrations uh, about the Last Supper because by the time uh, John wrote the Gospel, the fourth Gospel, uh, it was already a very prevailing common practice of the early church, and he felt that there is no need to uh, mention that. But instead, he gave that long uh, discourse of Jesus about the bread of life uh, to remind us that this bread broken is Jesus himself, who is the bread of life. The most common term, our day-to-day -day layman terms for the Eucharist is the Mass. The last part of the Mass is the dismissal blessings. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May I God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go glorifying the Lord by your life. That sending forth, that go forth, that instruction, go. You are sent forth. In Latin, the expression is ite misa es. So that word misa, go, go forth, is uh, then uh, using the phonetic translated as mass in English and in Chinese also we take the sound. So misa, that sending forth is the invitation for us, as I mentioned earlier, to return to our daily life and live out our faith that we celebrate in the sacramental way during the Mass. But this celebration is not meant to be an empty ritual. Just happen here for that one hour and then we forget about it. Rather, it provides us the strength and the guidance for our daily life. Our Christian belief and practice will become the best preparation for our next Mass. So you see that circular motion eh? coming in to celebrate in the liturgical form, the Eucharist, and going out to live out our faith in our daily life, and then bringing all our experiences in our daily life and coming back to give thanks and praise to God off love all our experiences and then returning to life again. That's why this last part of the Mass, which is the last part at the same time, it is actually the beginning, the beginning of living out what we experience in the Eucharist 
including listening to the word proclaimed, the scriptural proclamations, the homily. So we receive Christ present in the word and in the bread, in the consecrated bread. And then that experience is brought to our daily life. Another expression for the Eucharist is the Passover of Christ. The Eucharist is the memorial of Christ's Passover, especially his dying and rising from the dead. The Jews in the Old Testament time experienced the liberation from Egypt every time Passover is celebrated. So subsequently after that, that great Exodus experience, each time they hold the Passover celebrations, that Exodus experience is made present to the memory of the believers so that they may conform their lives to that great liberations. Now in the New Testament, when Christ celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples on the day before he suffered and died, Jesus introduced a new meaning to that Passover feast. When Christ celebrated the Passover feast with disciples, he transformed it into an anticipation of his sacrifice on the cross. He is to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So at that time, when he was having the last supper with the apostles, he was preparing them to experience that meaning, that past, that suffering and death of himself the next day. And that time when Jesus was crucified on the cross coincided with the moment when the Jews celebrated Paschal Feast and they slaughtered the lamb. Jesus became the replacement of that lamb of sacrifice. And each time now we celebrate the Eucharist, we understand, we commemorate Christ as that Pasch, the Passover. He who empowers us by his dying and rising to die to our sins, to be liberated from the yoke, from the chain of sins and experiencing our new life in him. Two questions concerning the Eucharistic prayer. What is the Eucharistic prayer? What's the significance of the Eucharistic prayers? I take these two questions as uh, being in a narrow sense. We speak of the Eucharist uh, with that general overall understanding. And during the Eucharist, we have some prayers uh, known as the Eucharistic prayer. As mentioned earlier, there are two main parts of the Eucharistic celebration. The first part is the liturgy of the word, where we have the proclamation of the word. On Sunday, there will be three readings. First one taken from the Old Testament, second one from the New Testament, except the four Gospels, and the third one, one of the four Gospels. And then we have the homily, the breaking of word. And then the second main part is the liturgy of the Eucharist. And that, that is this part when the prayers are offered and the, the prayers are known as the Eucharistic prayers. The liturgy of the Eucharist includes the offering and the presentation of bread and wine at the altar, the consecration of the bread and wine by the priest uh, using the Eucharistic prayer, and then the reception of the consecrated elements in Holy Communion. They, they are one unified whole. And this prayer uh, signifies the prayer of Jesus uh, also uh, during the Last Supper. And in that manner, then we are intimately united with the Lord. The prayer begins with, Father, you are holy indeed, and etc. Father, we bring you this gifts. Father, we ask you. So it is a worship offered to the Father by Christ, as it was at the moment of his passion, death, and resurrection. 
the last few days uh, in our uh, gospel reflections, we have the gospel readings taken from the Gospel of John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. This text in the Gospel of uh, John includes the instruction of Jesus as well as the great prayer of Jesus. Just pray, for example, that Father, that they may be one just as you and I are one. Huh? So that, that prayer of Jesus during the Last Supper is expressed uh, in the Eucharistic prayer. Huh? So the priests represent Jesus during the celebration of the Eucharist to pray on his behalf and offer up the prayer huh? together with that the whole congregations we united as uh, the body of Christ, the church. If you listen carefully uh, to the Eucharistic prayer, you have that consecration part. Take, this is my body. Take, this is my mind. That's the consecration part. And then you, you hear, after that, the proclamation of faith, uh, a long prayer. That long prayer is um, precisely a prayer of unity, uh, of showing that the whole church is united. Uh, the church on earth, we people who are now still living in this world, united with the faithful departed, including our ancestors, our parents, our grandparents who have left this world, and also with the saints in heaven, Mother Mary, her spouse and Joseph, uh, the apostles and all the saints, so this Eucharistic prayer expresses this unity, this communion of saints together with Christ. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. A few questions uh, concerns comparison between uh, the Catholic understanding of the Eucharist and the uh, Christian understanding, uh, the other Christian denominations. Sometimes we use the term uh, Protestants uh, to, to refer. So is the Eucharist important to the Protestants? How do the Protestants view the Eucharist? Is the Eucharist for real or just something symbolic? This third question here, uh, the person who asked it, uh, most likely understand to some extent that in the Christian church, they see the Eucharist more as symbolic uh, rather than the real presence. Uh, I will explain in my answer. How does Christ uh, become really present during the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist? So the question about real presence. Why is the Eucharist seen as transformation the real body of Christ instead of seeing it as a symbol representation of the body of Christ? So here we have uh, uh, a few words that is uh, commonly used in that uh, explanation, uh, signs, symbols, representations, sacraments. They are related, uh, but we use the terms differently. And if you kind of uh, grasp the, the use, but, but of course, uh, different people use the terms differently. So I, I will give you a brief explanation. Uh, if you need clarification, I will explain furthermore. Why is the Eucharist used in the holy hour instead of the crucifix? Does the Eucharist hold a higher importance, sacredness than the crucifix? That concerns also the, the question about the real presence and the crucifix as a uh, sacramental, as a symbol. Some Protestants view the adorations of the as idolatry, as it's treated with, as we treat it with so much reverence. How do you respond uh, to these accusations? Uh, so, all these are linked to, to some extent the Protestants' uh, theology. Now, first, uh, an explanation of the meaning of sign. Sometimes we use symbol interchangeably. Eh? Uh, so, some people use the term symbol and sign with different uh, connotations. But in general, most people uh, use the word sign and symbol to, to mean the same thing. Uh, in general, a sign or a symbol is a familiar object that we use to point towards an unfamiliar reality. In our day-to-day -day example would be, for example, the traffic lights. Uh, the traffic lights, they are meant to be signs. Signs with regard to the, the movements of the vehicles uh, to indicate when to stop, when to be 
cautious and when to move on. In religion, uh, of course, we have many other signs in our day-to-day -day context. Uh, for example, uh, the national song, the national flag, etc. Uh, these are symbol with regard to uh, our nationhood. And in religion, if a sign is purely symbolic, then it doesn't refer to, to the divine. It indicates something of the divine, but it does not participate in the divine. So we, we call it a sign when this sign tries to indicate something about the faith, whatever faith that may be. Huh? We have so many religions in the world. Huh? But if the sign does not participate in the divine, then it would have a different meaning, a different connotations. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, in religion, science can be used in two ways. One way, it simply does points towards something of the divine, indicates something of the divine. But the second way, is, which is a stronger, deeper, more intense way of understanding the sign is that it not only indicates, but it participates in the divine. And that is the way the difference between the Catholic understanding of the Eucharist and other people. In the church, we have the seven sacraments. You have the symbol there uh, in the picture, baptism, holy order, Eucharist, confirmation, uh, marriage, confession, anointing. Now, the seven sacraments, they are signs which enable us to participate in the divine reality. It means the sacramental signs do not just point towards, do not just indicate something of the divine, but they actually brings us into that communion, into that connection with the Lord. We have another term that we use in the church, sacramentus. Sacramentus refers to, for example, crucifixes, statues, medals, and, and so forth. Now, when we use sacramentus, the meaning then is lesser. In that, uh, when we use the crucifix, for example, yeah, we have an experience of Christ in a way we contemplate on his suffering and death for us on the cross. We appreciate the love that he has shown us. So when we look at the crucifix, we are able to meditate on, on these realities. But in a way that holding the crucifix itself does not en enable us to participate in the divine life. Whereas when we celebrate the sacraments, now we are talking about the Eucharist, for example, then when we receive the consecrated bread and wine, we believe that it is the real presence of Jesus. So we participate in the divine life of Jesus. We receive Jesus into our lives. And that is a reality. That is something not just imagine, not just as if, not just symbolic. It is sacramental. We actually participate in that reality. That's why there's a question that I use that, for example, in our uh, communal prayer, the way we try to help ourselves to, to be aware of the presence of Jesus. When the, there's a priest, uh, we have the exposition of the Eucharist. Uh, when there's no priest, and then uh, usually we may just have exposition of the crucifix or, or the Bible. So in that sense, the crucifix or the Bible being presented, they, they are signs, they indicate, they guide us to, to Jesus. But when we expose the blessed sacrament, then we believe that Jesus is truly present there in the blessed sacrament. And, and therefore, it is a stronger experience of his presence. And the Eucharistic celebration, the Mass, is the reenactment of the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary. 
And that experience is made present in the Passover of Christ, as I explained earlier. So we Catholics believe in the words of Jesus when he says uh, during the Last Supper, this is my body, take and eat. So we will receive Holy Communion. We believe that we truly receive Jesus, his real presence. Jesus is tr truly being united with us, divine and human. It is not just as if uh, Jesus is there. It is not just uh, a good feeling. That's why uh, for us Catholics, we are very serious about giving that reverence to the consecrated uh, host, the Eucharist. If for some accident, uh, the priest dropped the, the, the pattern, uh, the, the, the dish that holds the vessel sacrament, and we will reverently collect uh, the consecrated host and uh, try to consume it. For, for some Christian groups, if that accident happened, they, they may just collect the, the bread and dispose of it uh, lightly. For them, that's okay because it is only symbolic. Just that as if, for example, if you have a broken crucifix, what to do with it, uh, you, you, yeah, you just wrap it up and you can dispose of it. But not the consecrated host, not the Holy Communion. If we drop it, we will pick it up reverently and, and consume it. And during the Holy Hour, exposition of the sacred host expresses our belief in the real presence of Jesus. Uh, is definitely a more powerful way of uh, helping us to experience Christ's presence. So with that, uh, it's linked to the question about the being revealing for the Eucharist. Uh, so we have the question, should we receive Holy Communion in the hand or on the tongue? This question implied for some people that one form is more reverential than the other form. Uh, but is that true? The other question, why some priests do not appear to give much reverence to the Eucharist when preparing for during the Holy Communion? Uh, this question is a bit judgmental. <laughs> uh, we, we do not just look from the external to judge the heart of the celebrant, whether he's reverential or not. So I would hesitate to put the question in that manner, but this is whoever uh, writes this question, present it in a way. I feel that it, it seems to be a bit judgmental, which we shouldn't. 19, it appears that some Catholics don't seem to give much reverence when receiving Holy Communion. What can we do about it? Again, this question also seems to be a bit judgmental because only God knows the heart. Uh, we, we are not to judge the people. But perhaps the person is just looking at, at, at the external and interpret certain action uh, behavior as not being re reverential. Uh, well, this can be very personal, so I, I don't want to make further comment about that. But I will just uh, discuss in a general manner about uh, reverence uh, for the Eucharist. Now, from a historical point of view, communion in hand or on the tongue has been two accepted forms. There are attempts from people who support receiving communion in hand and those on, on the tongue to search for documents or what they call evidences to demonstrate uh, what the predominant practice was in the past and trying to say that historically from when to when uh, it seems that uh, most people use hand, most people use tongue and, and therefore uh, this is a more reverential way of receiving uh, the Eucharist etc. Mm. However for me it, it is really irrelevant to infer from what people in the past did to conclude from there what we should do today uh, because there are historical reasons why at certain point of time uh, there, there was greater emphasis on receiving by tongue, there's certain time uh, greater reasons uh, by hand. There were historical link uh, circumstances and so forth. Uh, so it, it is not in that sense appropriate to say that just because at certain years from this year to that year, it, it seems to be uh, more people and, and more Church leaders seem to be emphasizing one, and, and therefore it means that today we have to be like that. 
I think uh, that, that kind of connection is not necessary. I think the important question is, why do you use one form rather than the other? You as in us, uh, uh, and for people who, a particular person who advocate that you must only receiving in hand or you must only receiving on tongue, you, you yourself must know why you want to make that choice. A person's uh, sense of reverence is in the heart, uh, not just the, the external actions. Eh? So, so some people, they may want to use the bowing to express their reverence and so forth. For others, uh, they may not see it necessary as a way to show their reverence. Eh? So there is no yes or no answer to that. Again, it is a matter of the heart. Eh? What I want to emphasize is that we are not to judge people, uh, whether they bow or they don't bow, whether they receive communion in the hand or on the tongue, and to claim that one is more reverential than the other. We are not to judge by their external behaviors. Eh? Man judges by appearances, God judges the hearts. And who appoint us uh, to be the judge of another person's internal disposition? Eh? So the issue is, is not to judge. Eh? The issue is about yourself. Okay, if you think that you want to receive in hand, then you must know why you choose that. If you think that you want to receive uh, on your tongue, then you must also know why you that. Don't just insist on it uh, and claim that it is it is one way or another uh, without actually you knowing what or you just following people. Someone, my uncle says so, my catechist says so, or whatever. Yeah, they say so, but they must also tell you the reason and you yourself must be convinced of the reasons so that you can act from your heart and not just by hearsay. So the other issue is how we appreciate Holy Communion and what effect has Holy Communion in our lives. And will receiving in hand or on tongue make a difference to the way you, you love God better? and uh, that you practice your faith better in life. So if whichever form is going to help you to practice your faith better in life, help you to be closer to Jesus, so be it. Uh, but don't impose your own idea onto other people. For me, Holy Communion has two significance. One is that it expresses and realize or communion with the Lord. We want to be in union with the Lord, so we receive Holy Communion. And the church tells us that we can receive it either on the tongue or in our hands. So both are okay, both are acceptable. So don't accuse one, criticize the other, or, or do things like that, don't. Second part about our the significance of communion is it is also expressing a communion with our fellow Catholics, the body of Christ. We cannot love Jesus the head and not love and care for the parts of his body. So by receiving the same Jesus, we are united as one body of Christ. So Holy Communion is not just about Jesus and I. Of course, that is very important. But Holy Communion is also about we and our fellow Catholics. And this part is sometimes overlook or even ignore by some Catholics, which is of course wrong. Huh? And it is self-contradictory or ironical if we claim to receive Jesus reverently and yet root and hush and condemn our fellow Catholics who have different preference for the form of receiving communion, then, then, then we are breaking that communion. We can state our preference and explain our reasons, but we have no right to judge others. And more importantly, put, put aside this negative aspect, focus on the positive side, our communion with the Lord and our communion with our fellow Catholics. My own preference of receiving communion is that we receive in the hands. And I give you my reasons. First, because Jesus gives himself to the disciples during the Last Supper, he says, take it and eat it. He didn't say, open your mouth, I, I feed you. 
he said, take it and eat it. Number two, it is obviously more hygienic uh, where there is no contact of the minister's fingers and the recipient mouths and lips. And then of course we are extra sensitive yeah, during this period of pandemic and so forth. And all the more we, for hygienic reason, we, we discourage receiving uh, communion uh, on the tongue. And third, a person's reverence is in the heart, whether the recipient is by hand or by tongue. And some people say that because uh, the tongue is the one that say evil things and, and do evil things with the tongues. Uh, some people on the other hand say the hand is the one that does evil things and naughty things and, and bad things. So whether it's hands or tongues, we can use for good or for bad. So it really materially makes no difference whether it's the hand or the tongue. But for these two other reasons that I mentioned here, my own preference is that you receive uh, with your hand. But of course, if you insist on your tongue, I wouldn't refuse you. Then there are a few questions about uh, whether I'm worthy to receive uh, the sacrament or not. Must I go for confession every time I receive communion? Sometimes I feel that I'm unworthy to receive Holy Communion. Fear of not being able to follow where Jesus challenges and judgment are certainly huge, especially secular and moral world. How can we find strength to assist, resist persecution of position, encouragement to deal with our failures in life? So the question about adequacy, inadequacies, unworthiness. And then if one is a baptized Catholic and have not received Jesus in the Eucharist, uh, in this COVID situation, is one committing a, a mortal sin? And because you cannot go to church, you cannot receive communion, is it a mortal sin? So these, these are, I think, interrelated questions. Uh, so I put it uh, with a title uh, about worthy uh, reception. The church uh, teaching is that when someone have a grave sin or sins, then he should go for confession before receiving communion. Uh, this is because any genuine act of public worship, in this case, the, the Eucharistic celebration, must reflect an essential harmony between God and the one who worships. Holy Communion is a gift from God. Jesus gave of himself to be with us and it should not be demanded. And especially if the person knows that his ordinary way of life, his day-to-day -day living, demonstrate a refusal to conform to God's way. Uh, if in, in his day-to-day uh, -day living, he, he, he does things that contrary to the teaching of Jesus, he insulted uh, God and so forth. And then to want to receive communion seems then to be an irony, to be a self-contradiction. And therefore, the person should be aware that he should not receive communion because his actions and act of receiving communion is in contradiction. But this is not meant to be seen as a legal penalty but rather an attempt to, to foster spiritual integrity by stretching that the external act of receiving the communion, the sacrament, should correspond to the internal essential harmony between God and the communicants. So we desire God in our life. We want to be close to him. We want to follow the way of Jesus. We want to live out the gospel values. That is why we want Jesus to be with us. But if we say Jesus come and yet at the same time we hold a knife and we want to step at him, that would be a contradiction because our way of life is, is like that dagger huh? going to pierce the heart of Jesus. And yet here we are saying that we want to receive him. That, that would be seen as a contradiction. When someone is involuntarily prevented from receiving Holy Communion, as in the case of pandemic, so you, you can't book a mass, you can't attend, of course, it's not his fault. Uh, and it's, it's not even a venial sin. Uh, so don't talk about mortal sin. So do not be too scrupulous about that. Uh, so the person who mentioned that, uh, that, that, is that a mortal sin? I think it sounds a bit scrupulous uh, in, in that comment. Uh, it is a situation that is beyond our control. Uh. But the person, of course, can participate in spiritual communion by attending online mass. This is not ideal, but it's second best uh, since the circumstances does not permit. But as soon as the situation permits, then he or she should make every effort uh, to participate in the mass in person. Do not see 
uh, the participant of mass as, as if uh, watching a movie. Uh, you know, it's definitely not watching a movie. It's not just symbolic. It is sacramental. Uh, we want to experience the real presence of Jesus. Some more uh, small, smaller questions, uh, peripheral questions. People ask the question like, why ring the bells? Why the celebrant washes his hands? Why pour a drop water into the wine? Eh? If your observance, you, you recognize these small things uh, during the mass. But actually, these are, these are peripheral questions. These are not the essentials. Uh, but nonetheless, these questions may be interesting. Uh, so you want to know why this. So the ringing of bell is practiced uh, for historical reasons. You know that in the past, uh, when masses were celebrated with the priest facing the altar against the wall, then the bell ringing was to indicate uh, to the congregation the progress of the mass. Also because in the past, the mass was celebrated in Latin. So most people who had not training in Latin would not understand the words. And therefore, that bell ringing is a reminder to the participants that, okay, this is consecration time. This is uh, 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 this is before Holy Communion, etc. So people kind of make aware to the ringing of the bells. And the priest washing of the hands after preparation of the gifts is also for practical needs. Because uh, sometimes when you pour the wine and so forth, you may accidentally uh, stain your, 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 your fingers. Uh, with the wine, or uh, somehow the table is is, is dirty uh, because the sacristan had not cleaned it properly, and, and so you your hands. Uh, so it's for practical reasons, and the priest wash the hands. Uh, but nowadays, uh, it, it has become a practice uh, that it become a formality. Uh, even if the priest have not stained his hands, and uh, he still will go through that. Uh, it's so it's just part of it because you you don't want it to be. Sometimes you need, and then you wave to the service, and, but the service is always there. And so you, you just wash your hands. It's a practical need, actually, this one. As for pouring water into wine, uh, in the ancient world, the Greek and Romans added water to wine because it was often thick. The wine was thick, gritty, and strong. So it was simply appropriate, good taste to add water to the wine before drinking. Uh, although even it was not originally a Jewish custom to add water to wine, it soon became part of the Passover meal itself. And then from there, it brings into the celebration of the Eucharist and become part of the Mass. As early as the fourth century, Catechists explained that the water represented uh, the humility and the wine, the divinity. Once you put the water into the wine, it's impossible to take it out again. And because Jesus, humanity can never again be separated uh, from his divinity, and therefore the custom continues. Uh, th this will be added uh, spiritualization uh, of the actions, uh, which, which is meaningful in itself. Uh, this explanation is meaningful, uh, but actually the, the original uh, setting uh, uh, was uh, a more practical reason. And the practice of dropping a piece of consecrated bread into the cup may have started with an ancient practice. Christians in the suburbs could not always travel to Rome for Eucharist. And Rome is the chair of the Bishop of Rome, who is the Pope. So when the Bishop broke the bread before Holy Communion, he would set aside the piece for each missing groups. A minister then would brought this fermentum to each place later, where the priest would drop it into the chalice of the wine. And then almost everyone drank from the cup in those days. Thus, uh, the Bishop's Eucharist, the Pope's Eucharist, fermented uh, the celebration in the rural area. So there is this expression of that uh, communion, the connectedness uh, between uh, the different Christian communities. Eventually, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, also began to set aside a piece for his next celebration. This was called the Sacra. And it too was added to the chalice to show that this mass is a continuation of the one before it. It is the same one sacrifice of Christ. So it, it, it puts on such a spiritual uh, 
meaning uh, into their actions. And then subsequently, priests began imitating the Pope by breaking off a piece of bread thus consecrated. Some then explained that it is a sign of Christ's resurrection. A body without blood is dead, but when Christ's body is reunited with his blood, Christ is risen. Uh, this gesture also continues to this day, being preserved uh, probably because it is so ancient a custom. So I took this explanation from uh, this article uh, mentioned here. So you realize that some of these small actions uh, during the mass, uh, they started with some historical, practical purpose, and then it becomes part of the rituals uh, because as it, as it passed down the ritual, the forms of the celebrations, the church finds that yeah, these small actions, although it was initially just practical actions, but it can be explained in a very spiritual manner. And they find that that spiritual experience is meaningful also, and they are being preserved. The question, I don't get anything out of the mass. The mass is boring. So of course, this concern the attitudes of the participants. So it is puzzling for someone to make these comments. And because we, we, we will ask this person, uh, so what do you expect from the mass? Uh, what, what do you constitute not boring? <laughs> Beautiful singing? On the whole, I think our choirs are quite okay, above average. You expect nice homily, but what, what do you mean by nice homily? Uh, the priest tells a lot of jokes or, or what? I think our homilies on the whole are based on the scripture readings and they are nourishing. Uh, what, what, what do you want out of the Mass? You, you want to see miracles happen? But the transformation of the bread and wine to the body and whatever, that is a miracle. So, so what else do you want? <laughs> what else do you want the, the Mass to be to make it more exciting, more less boring? Is the Mass supposed to be a wish-granting machine? You come to Mass, you pray for something, you hope that your wish will come true. But we want to... Take note that we do not come to Mass demanding something. We come to Mass to give something. That something is our heart and our thanks to God. If you say that, what do I get out of the Mass? Instead of asking that question, perhaps is what do you bring to the Mass? What kind of attitude, what kind of heart do you bring to the Mass in worshipping the Lord in communion with your fellow Catholics, the believing community. And what do you get from the Mass if you have the right attitude? You receive a lot if you open your heart to God and to your fellow Catholics. But if you close your hearts, yes, maybe you get nothing. Some other questions, why not receiving communion in two species, both the body and blood? And why is the tabernacle and what is the tabernacle and what's its purpose in the church? Ideally, we, we are to receive both the consecrated wine and bread. But for practical reasons, uh, in most Catholic churches now, we receive only the body of Christ. Because when the congregation is too big, it is very difficult to arrange for the reception of the sacred blood without complications. You have the hygienic issue, you have drinking from the same same chalice but if you pour them into so-called uh, disposable plastic the church don't do that because for us every single drop of the consecrated wine is the blood of christ so we do not just dispose the small disposable cups away because it is not wine it's not just symbolic it is sacramental it is the real presence of jesus so for this uh reasons uh, the church when the congregation is big we do not practice uh, the reception of the sacred blood because we believe in the real presence of jesus uh, so uh, the tabernacle as, as you see in this picture is one of the tabernacles in our church you can see it prominently displayed is the home it is where Jesus lives. After the Mass, uh, the consecrated hosts are being brought home, brought place in the tabernacle, so that other people who are housebound, who have no chance to participate in the Mass, 
can receive Holy Communion also. So the priests or the ministers then will take the consecrated host from the tabernacle and bring uh, to the housebound or homebound so that they too can partake uh, in the body of Christ. Okay, so I have uh, answered <laughs> all the 29 questions, uh, categorize them in uh, different headings and try to answer them as uh, succinct and straightforward as possible. Mm -hmm.